So here we go again. Another week. <laughs> well, this is a very special shout out to all those of you on the night shift, doing a boring job where the hours slowly tick over. You know, I'm always here for you guys, and hopefully these stories help you get through the working day just a little bit more easily. Well, fantastic story for you this evening. It's from Jake Beach, the author of the story I did last week. And uh, this one's just as good, so hope you'll enjoy this one just as much as you did that one. Hey, you know what time it is now, don't you? Time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. Because it's time to listen. I did what anyone would do. I ran. The car was behind me. It was nearly midnight in late autumn, and there was no moon in the sky. I could see, though. The flames coming off my now-destroyed car made sure of that. I can't really remember what happened. I was driving. I saw... something. Maybe a deer. I can't remember. I just know I saw a form run out in front of me, so I swerved. A tire left the asphalt, hit the gravel and leaves on the side, and it pulled me right off the road. Then everything was just a blur until I hit something. I'm not sure how long I was out, but when I woke up, I could see as clear as day, and I knew I needed to get out, so I ran. It was a foggy sort of night, not anything extraordinary, just a little misty. Fog is strange in that it lowers visibility, but makes lights glow much brighter, or rather larger, than they normally would. I could still see the glow from my car. Having reached a safe distance, I figured I could look back at it. And I could also see another glow, though I couldn't see its source. As I got closer to it, I saw that it was a farmhouse. Country people are famously friendly, so I thought I could knock on their door, use their phone, and get out of here even at this hour of the night. I got to the door and knocked, though not too loudly. I wouldn't want to frighten whoever lived there. No response. I knocked a little louder. No response. So, I knocked loudly. This time a light came on through a window, but slowly. Not like they'd just turned on a lamp, but like they'd lit a candle. Finally, I heard someone turn the knob, and then the door opened. He rubbed sleep from his eyes and asked who I was. I explained my situation, trying to keep my voice from raising into an excited tone. The man made a sort of noise halfway between a sigh and a chuckle and welcomed me in. I was right. It was a candle. I saw it setting on the stand next to the door as I entered. You have a lovely home, I said, trying to ease the tension and compliment my potential saviour. He bowed his head in thanks and motioned for me to sit down. He walked into the kitchen, and as he did so he flipped a switch. The room I was in, which I asserted was some sort of living room or den, flooded with light. It looked like you might think any farmhouse would look. Wooden, possibly handmade furniture all around. Furniture upholstered in a fabric of earth tones, making designs that look vaguely like a camo pattern. A few taxidermied animals setting around, including an eight-point deer head on the wall, a beaver, and what looked to me like some sort of big, hangry weasel. While I was looking around and taking in the cozy atmosphere, the man brought me a cup of coffee. Oh, thank you, I said to him, trying to sound as grateful as I could. Again, he bowed his head in acknowledgement. Would you mind if I used your phone? I blurted out. I know country people are often more slower paced than we city people are, but I had a burning car to take care of. Nah, he finally spoke. Oh, thank you. Where is it? Nah, I mean, I ain't got a phone. Does me no good. Oh, I said, audibly disappointed. But my car is on fire. It could burn down the trees near it. I said pleadingly, as though this urgency would magically give him a telephone. Won't hurt nothing, he drawled. Just rained. Sides, 
Them trees are all alone. If they catch, nothing else will. He seemed sure. And this calmed me down. Okay, thank you. After a long silence, I said, Oh, but then, how will I call a tow truck? Or a ride out of here? Without looking at me, only drinking his own coffee, he said, I'll be driving you into town tomorrow morning. Drop you off at a mechanic. You can take care of it from there. He already had a plan. This gave me a huge feeling of comfort. Seeing him drink his coffee reminded me to have some of my own, so I didn't appear ungrateful. I was about to open my mouth to speak when he said, You'll be sleeping on the couch tonight. Blankets on the back. Arm rest for a pillow. He motioned towards the couch I was sitting on, answering the question I was about to ask. <sighs> Thank you, sir. Again with the bow. He got up, finishing his coffee, putting out a hand to take my cup if I was done. <laughs> Still working on it, I said and smiled. He continued taking his own cup to the kitchen and placing it in the sink. I heard the sound of a door creaking open, and then he mumbled something, but I couldn't tell what. He mumbled again, with a tone like he was answering someone, defending himself. I thought maybe his wife wasn't happy with him letting a stranger in here, and was too afraid to come out herself. His voice hit a tone of quick anger, and he stopped talking. He returned to the room. I won't be any trouble. You can tell her that, I said, letting him know I heard, but smiling so he knew I wasn't offended. He gave a quick nod. He placed the candle that he'd used to answer the door on the stand next to the couch. Turn out this light before you sleep, he pointed directly to the switch. Yes, sir. I found myself bowing my head like he had been. He walked across the room and sat down again. We sat in silence for some time. I didn't know what to talk about, and he seemed to be fine with not talking. I didn't see a TV anywhere, so this must just be what he does. I saw a few books, but their covers looked dusty. Turn out this light before you sleep, he said again. I wasn't sure if he'd forgotten that he'd already said it, or if he was just emphasizing this point. I nodded. You don't have to stay up on my account. I said, offering him the chance to excuse himself to bed. <clears throat> he grunted ambiguously. Not that I'm not enjoying your company. I just don't want to put you out. Your wife would probably feel better if you were in the other room with her anyway. He looked at me askance. I mean, I'm not going to steal anything. I felt sweat forming on my brow, wishing I could just shut up. Not that you think I'm going to. I trailed off. I hung my head, embarrassed. I saw a half-smile appear on his face. I smiled then too, abashedly. <laughs> I just want you and your wife to know I'm not dangerous, is what I'm, I'm trying to say. He bowed his head again, knowingly. He had already assessed me. If he thought I was threatening, he wouldn't have let me in. He rose from his seat. As he walked past the doorway, he stopped and turned his head, but not enough for me to see his feature. Turn this light out before you sleep. I nodded again, then remembering he couldn't see me, said, Yes, sir. Must be his memory, I thought. I picked up one of the dusty books. After dusting it off, I could see it was a lovely book, bound in dyed leather with a gold design dancing around the edge of it. No title was imprinted on it. The pages also had gold leaf. I opened to a page that was dog-eared. The book turned out to be a Bible. It opened to Corinthians, chapter 15. A few of the verses were underlined. So it will be the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. These verses must have helped them through a death, I thought. Perhaps of a child. They were all alone, and he said they had no use for a telephone. I felt my eyes begin to water as I imagined the sad, lonely life they must live out here. 
I closed the book and placed it next to the candle. There was a single, strike-anywhere match lying on the holder beneath the stick. I hoped I didn't have to get up more than once in the dark. I had no idea what time it was, but it was late. So I pulled the blanket off the back of the couch, laid down, and closed my eyes. I shot up from the couch immediately, remembering the words of the old man. I turned out the light before I slept. I returned to my position on the couch and was asleep in no time. I don't know how long I was asleep before a sound woke me up. I opened my eyes and peered through the doorway that led into the kitchen. Silhouetted by the dim light coming through the window, I could see two forms, the man and the woman, standing by the sink. I heard him fill a cup with water and saw the shadow hand it toward his wife. The cup shattered as it hit the tile floor of the kitchen. I saw his head begin to turn, so I closed my eyes, not wanting him to think I'd been spying on them. I opened them a few seconds later to see his arm around her, as if reassuring her that he wasn't mad about the cup. He bent over to pick up the pieces of the cup. The form of the woman swayed slightly, as if standing was an effort. He seemed to remember this as he suddenly shot his body up and steadied her with his arms, pulling her closer to him. It was sweet to see such pure love at such an old age. He filled another cup, and this time he held it for her. He walked out of view, tugging on her arm. Her body turned as if it was willing, but she only shook, refusing to take any steps. I hoped my presence hadn't scared her that much. She couldn't hold a cup or stand well, though, so I just attributed it to her old age and failing body. I saw his arms reach around her and pick her up, as though she were a little girl. His steps faded as they went into the other room. Then he returned for her cup of water, having delivered her to bed. His steps once again faded, but then they returned. I saw his form start to appear in the window, and then I closed my eyes, again not wanting him to think I was watching, though I was. I heard no motion for several seconds. I opened my eyes slightly so that someone far away, in the dark, wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And there stood his shadow, in the doorway, facing me. I shut my eyes quickly, hoping he wasn't angry. An intimidatingly long amount of time went by before I heard him saunter off, back into the bedroom. I breathed a heavy sigh and wiped the sweat from my forehead and palms. I felt my heart racing. I couldn't figure out why he'd stared at me for so long. While recovering from the fear, I drifted off to sleep again. I awoke once more, this time not due to any sounds, but because I had to go to the bathroom. I sat up, realizing he never told me where it was, but as there were no doors in here, I at least knew where I had to start looking. I tried lighting the match a few times on different surfaces, before I was able to find one that it would light on. I lit the candle, blew out the match, and set it on the stand. I walked out into the kitchen, using the dim but warm candlelight to navigate my way. The kitchen looked just as rustic as the living room did. I was paying too much attention to the decor, and not enough to where I was stepping, and felt a sudden stab of pain in my foot. I held in a gasp as I looked down, Red soaked through the bottom of my sock. The man had stood up so suddenly to steady his wife that he'd abandoned his efforts to clean the rest of the shards of the teacup. I bent over, picking up what pieces I could see, and placed them on the countertop. The candlelight danced around the room as I looked for a door to the bathroom. I saw two doors at the end of the room. One went straight, while the other was off to the side. The one off to the side was open a crack. What little light peeked through it illuminated a bed with two forms. One was large, laying on its side, with an arm around the smaller form of the other. On its back, her arms over his. I thought about how most people would be lucky to find a love like this. Maybe when people are stuck all alone in a house together for years, they have no choice but to stay so close. As I smiled, I walked toward the other door and opened it. It was the bathroom. After finishing, I returned to my spot on the couch, blew out the candle and fell asleep, 
warmed by the vision of the bodies cuddling on the bed. The next time I was woken up, it was by the pleasant smell of eggs and bacon cooking. I rose from the couch, the house filled with the sunlight from outside. The view outside the window was pleasant, and the pink in the sky told me that it was still quite early. I felt rested, though. Anyway, I wasn't about to sleep through a real, country, home-cooked breakfast. I stumbled into the kitchen. Good morning. I got another bow in reply. Sorry about that, he said as he motioned to the shards of teacup on the counter and the trail of blood left by my sock. Oh, that's all right. I'm sorry about not cleaning it up, but it would have been too hard by candlelight. I'd hoped to wake up before you and clean it. It's all right, he said. He motioned to the small kitchen table. I sat down at one of the places. He shoveled out bright yellow scrambled eggs, the most delicious I'd ever smelled and forked four pieces of bacon onto my plate. S'more if you want any. I nodded. I waited for him to sit before eating. They had a Bible in the living room, so they might also say grace, I reckoned. He motioned eagerly to the plate, smirking as if he knew why I wasn't eating yet. I dug into the delicious food. It was the best breakfast I'd ever had. As I was shoveling more egg into my mouth, he handed me a piece of toasted homemade bread, with what I assumed to be homemade butter on it as well. As I ate, he dished out two more plates of food, putting one at each end of the table. He sat down to the one furthest from the bedroom door, which was shut entirely, probably to keep the noise of cooking breakfast out of the room. He bowed his head to give a quick, silent grace. Out of respect, I stopped chewing and also bowed my head though keeping my eyes on him, so I knew when I could return to the greatness that sat before me. I was savouring the last few bites of my meal, when I realised the woman had never come out to breakfast. Will your wife be joining us? I asked, hoping he didn't take it as rudeness. He shook his head. He must have noticed the puzzled look on my face, as I wondered why he'd bothered to set a place for her if he knew the answer. Never comes out to breakfast. As problems walk in, Said it just, just in case. His eyes became glossy. That's very sweet of you, I said and smiled. He cleared his throat and stood from the table, disregarding the rest of his food. I imagine it was so he could cover whatever tears may have come to his face, as he remembered a time when they weren't so controlled by their aging bodies. We'll leave in a while, he grunted gaining composure but moving past the subject. Thank you. Don't rush. I'm in no hurry. I lied. I appreciated the hospitality and the food, but I wanted to get home. I saw him nod. Got to do some chores, then we can go, he said as he walked out the door, not even grabbing a jacket. I nodded my assent to his back. Just sit on the couch and wait. I'll be a while. I walked into the living room, preparing for more boredom, but reliving the meal I'd just eaten in my memory. As soon as I sat down, I remembered the meal the man had left on the table. I got into the kitchen, ready to clean the dish, when I got an idea. I could reheat this and give it to his wife. She would maybe feel better about having me in the house, and I'd get to thank her for not convincing her husband to kick me out in my time of need. I turned the oven on low and placed the plate inside for just a few minutes, enough to warm the food, but not enough to make it so hot that I couldn't carry it. I also decided that I'd get her a teacup of water to go with it. Then I saw the bread. That was some of the best toast I'd ever had, so I toasted her a slice and buttered it up for her. The man came inside, saw me with a plate of food, buttering toast, and smiled at me. Didn't have to wait till I was gone. I simply smiled back, not wanting to embarrass him by correcting his assumption. He grabbed something from the wall, I couldn't tell what, and walked back outside. Finally finished, I placed the toast on the plate and walked over to the door. I knocked lightly. No response. I knocked again, slightly harder. Still no response. 
But the door, having not been latched all the way, slid open slightly, not past the door jam. I thought maybe she was still sleeping, or perhaps too nervous to speak to me, knowing her husband was outside. I figured I could just leave the plate on a nightstand, and she could eat it when she was ready. I slowly pushed the door open and began tiptoeing in. I saw the nightstand through the opening door and began walking toward it. Through the corner of my eye, I saw that her eyes were open. Oh, excuse me, I began as I turned my eyes toward her. I gasped and dropped the plate to the floor, ceramic and food flying everywhere at my feet. The woman was very clearly dead and had been so for quite some time. Her lips were slightly open, tightly spanned around yellow teeth. Her skin was dark brown, like leather, but less expertly made, wrinkled in some areas, drawn too tightly around others. Her body was placed on a pillow, mostly prone, elevated slightly, her arms folded on her lap in front of her, hands brown and fingernails yellow. Her hair was matted in some places, but a braid looked fresh and clean, laying across her shoulder. Her lifeless eyes, probably glass, stared out directly in front of her, the eyelids wrapped too tightly around them. As I took this in, unable to move or completely process anything, I heard the door slam behind me. The man must have heard the plate shatter and return to see what had happened. I turned around, stunned, mouth agape, as he looked at me, eyebrows furrowed, but his face blushing with tears streaming down his face. I couldn't tell if he was angry or embarrassed, but I knew that I was terrified, so I did what anyone would do. I ran. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. 